American Wheels, Chinese Roads. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. China is the world's biggest auto market by number of vehicles sold, making this market a crucial part of the growth plans for every major automaker, including American brands like GM, which has depended on sales in China to head off bankruptcy in the U.S. Local brands are fighting to hold on to their share of the market as well. Who's winning the battle? Let's find out. We're joined in our studio today by Michael Dunn, president of Dunn & Company, a consultancy specializing in Asian car markets and a leading expert on China's auto industry. He's also the author of American Wheels, Chinese Roads, the story of General Motors in China. Michael, thanks for coming in today. Good morning. Let's start with your book. So in 2009, as GM in the U.S. was headed towards bankruptcy, its Chinese subsidiary was setting new sales and profit records. What were some of the conclusions you drew from what they were doing right in China? Yeah, it's true. In 2009, Detroit was flat on its back, uh, ready to sell its subsidiary in Europe, going into bankruptcy. And yet here in China, you couldn't build Buicks or Chevys fast enough. There was demand for the cars. Profits were sensational. It was, hey, what gives here? How can things be so bad over there and so good here? I think the answer is that GM developed in China a spirit of entrepreneurship that was quite different from what had existed in North America or Europe before. Brand new culture that said, we're in a foreign country with different laws and different consum consumer tastes. If we don't hustle, adapt, we're not going to make it here. So from the very beginning, they decided we want to be competitive, and that over time paid off. So who decided that? Was that GM headquarters that decided that, or was it that they put a very savvy general manager for China here? Because oftentimes we talk about uh, on our show the disconnect uh, in some cases between global headquarters and their Chinese operations, which often leads to trouble. But if things are working, is that you know, credit to the head office and their strategy, or is that really the local team uh, yeah. in know, executing? Yeah, in this case, so you're exactly right. In this case, both get big credit. Um, Jack Smith was the chairman and CEO of General Motors, and he announced to the company, many of you can't find China on a map. We're going in, and we're going in big. Then he appointed a couple guys, the first guy's name is Rick Swando, and later a guy named Phil Murtaugh to run the show. And he said, whatever it takes to make this successful, you have my support. Go and get it done. Now that's not usual for corporations out of America. Right. And the guys on the ground here took Jack Smith at his word, and they started to say, okay, what is it, what's required? First thing they did was say, our brand, Buick, most Chinese never heard of it. So they invested heavily in building a exclusive aura about the Buick brand that still carries on today. Which is fascinating because for those of us who spent a lot of time in North America, the Buick brand really didn't have any luster or you know any of its original um, shine and prestige. That's and, right. And yet they were able to create that from scratch yes. uh, in China. And I remember actually quite a, a few years ago looking at certain Buick models here and thinking, this is actually not a bad looking car. Pretty good, very good looking car today. And, and it seemed in some cases that the design originating in China actually ended up going overseas. Um, because I remember seeing certain models here first and then going overseas and then a couple of years later and seeing it introduced. So I, I think it's fascinating. Were actually design decisions and successes here transported uh, overseas back into their home base, if you will, um, and then applied there? That's exactly what happened. Um, now, today, 80% of Buicks sold worldwide are sold in China. So the Chinese consumer very much drives the taste, the look, the feel, uh, the powertrain, the engine of the Buicks that are built not only here in China, but back in the United States. And in terms of design cues, China is ahead of the game. Uh, it also helped GM a lot that their partner here is the city of Shanghai. And everyone knows Shanghai, when it competes, competes to win. So they said, in order for us to be best in class, we really have to have terrific design and a, and a brand that's powerful. So GM benefited also from the competitive drive of their Shanghai, Shanghai partners. Designs were created here, and then as you say, exported back to America, and people back in America saying, hey, these Buicks are better looking than ever. Now, it's interesting you talk about the importance of the local partner, because obviously GM is not the only 
uh, auto manufacturer. Is it true that most actually international automakers have a local partner yeah. that they are encouraged to work with or mandated to work it's with? It's a mandate. It's a requirement. Uh, if you want to sell car, manufacture and sell cars here in China, you have to have a local partner, and that partner must have no less than 50%. So. So, so why does it work in uh, GM's case, uh, but we don't really hear about successes for all the other brands? Well, many other brands have succeeded uh, here. Volkswagen does very well, as does, say, Hyundai or Mercedes-Benz, BMW. The difference with GM is that they have, and this is within the industry, it's understood, GM and Ch City of Shanghai have the best cooperation. And a lot of credit, I think, goes to GM and said, hey, we want to be as open and as generous as we can with our technology, we trust you as a partner to reciprocate in terms of political support, financial support, when we get into trouble, if we get into trouble. So during the 2009 financial crisis, City of Shanghai, uh, their partner really helped GM out uh, with credit lines and things like that. So it's been reciprocal and it's worked for GM. Do any of the other partnerships then look at that as a successful benchmark and have they learned and started to evolve based on looking at this or are they still doing their own independent thing? Yeah, the jury's still out. Most other joint ventures look with some envy at GM in their relationship with SAIC. At the same time, they say, well, uh, we're going to stick to our guns. Our number one priority is to defend the rights of our own brand, whether it be Volkswagen or BMW or Audi. And if we can get along with our partners, well, that's a bonus. Mm. In, in some cases, there's new models created uh, in China. And we've seen this with Honda and, and Nissan creating models similar to the way that Buick did, but I would argue that's different because Buick actually had the nameplates back in the U.S. Yes. And here they were just doing a newer evolution of it. Mm -hmm. But there have been original vehicles being created in China through these partnerships that haven't all done uh, that well. And there's an argument being made that sometimes that's because they're actually created not for the consumer and not for practical use, but really more to satisfy, as, as you mentioned earlier, the mandates that are put on these partnerships. Do you think this is sustainable in the long run? Yeah, that's exactly the case. These new brands are absolutely a product of a mandate from above. No Chinese consumer was out there saying, you know what I wish more than ever is to see a new brand because there's already 80 brands in the market. We don't need any more brands. The government wants to see new brands to give Chinese automakers yet another chance at building homegrown brands, which they haven't been successful at doing. Sustainable or not, well, Beijing ultimately makes the rules of the game, and as long as they hold on to those rules, those brands will be here. But it's a tough, tough road to hoe when no customer is asking for that brand, and yet it's created by fiat or mandate. Why would they do that, though? Would they, is it insufficient consumer research up front, or is it just a complete lack of, of interest in wanting to do that because they feel like that's not their core business, but they have to do it. So they kind of put the, the lowest minimal amount of resources and then they try to focus on what they believe is their core product line. Right, there's a very specific reason why the government has mandated the creation of these new brands. And that is that 25, 30 years ago, China said, hey, we want to build our own world-class auto industry. And the way to do that is to form joint ventures with the global manufacturers, including Ford, GM, Toyota, Honda, Hyundai, you name it. Over time, we're bound to learn how to do it ourselves and we'll be able to create our own brand names. 25 years later, that hasn't happened. If you look on the streets of Shanghai, nine of 10 cars here are still foreign branded. And this causes no end of frustration for the officials in Beijing. Hey, we set you guys up with joint ventures 25 years ago. Where are the results? And uh, they say, well, it's hard for us to wrest the technology from the foreign partner foreign companies still own the brand mm -hmm. and they own the intellectual property around the models. That doesn't go to the Chinese partner. Well, well, sorry, what about in cases where um, like Volvo, for example, mm -hmm. was actually acquired? Acquired. That's a special case. In that case, they went out and said, we're not going to fool with the joint venture. We'll buy the whole thing. Right. So in that case, China does own the brand outright. And it, if it's managed well, it could be a great success story. But in the meantime, the Chinese government is saying for the joint ventures, you guys can't keep marking time and not building your own brand. With the new mandate, with the new joint ventures, new brands, the rules are changed. Any products coming out of those new brands are jointly owned by the foreigner 
and the Chinese side. With a majority to the Chinese side? At least or? 50%. Okay. And often more. That's, that's unprecedented. Meaning, so. meaning that they own the brand and also um, they co-own any of the underlying technology. Exactly. Okay. That's a total difference. And that has foreign automakers a little bit concerned because once they have the brand and the product, they can start exporting to markets worldwide and competing against their partner. Which, uh, you know, we see happening in other industries as well, where partnerships turn into um, competitive situations. Yes. Um, but at the same time, do you believe that this is where the road is inevitably heading and that the global automakers should actually be investing their hearts and, and into trying to co-build these brands because they still do partly mm -hmm. own them. They do partly own Whereas if they resist and there's failure here, it feels like there could be continuing evolution of the rules of the game mm -hmm. where at, at one point, you know, the automakers, the global automakers actually may be in a position where they're just going to lose anyways. And right now, if they have the opportunity to build truly world-class mm -hmm. brands, at least they'll still own a piece of that pie. Yeah, are they ready to make that leap of faith? And when the China market becomes much larger than their home market, as is the case with the Germans, they have to look at it and say, let's be realistic, guys. Where's our future? Our future's in Asia, in China, that's where the profits are. Let's get together with these guys and have binding relationships. So Mercedes last year, interestingly, made a big investment in Beijing Auto Industry Corporation, their partner. That's a science strategic move. Mm -hmm. We're getting real close with you, not only in this joint venture and the new brand, but even at the parent level. Right. And, and now, so the interests are in, instrictly oh tied, tied together. They're getting tied together, more aligned. But that's not the rule. Everyone's looking and dodging and weaving and saying, do we have more leverage or do they have more leverage? How is this thing going to sort out? Can you talk about any Chinese brands that have caught your eye or have done something right? I mean, in 2010, there's lots of news about BYD, I believe it was, mm -hmm. that had a best-selling model yes. for the year. But um, you know, this year, it's domestic uh, car brands in terms of sales are at its lowest point in the past five years. That's right. So That's what, right. what, what happened, happened yeah. and, and are these local brands still more like flash in the pans? And you know, which ones are actually, do you think, on the right path towards becoming truly let's say national, mm -hmm. if not yet global competitors. Okay, so BYD you mentioned, in fact, 2010 F3, best-selling model in the market, shocked everyone. Well, what, part of what happened there is the market grew by 45%, so everyone was up. And in particular, uh, characteristic of the Chinese market is that almost 75% of people buying cars that year were buying for the first time. So in China, word of mouth, there's a great little car, $10,000, BYD, Brand new company, go. And it had this sort of halo effect, a uh, honeymoon period. Everyone went out and bought them. Well, then they discovered that Chinese cars, including BYD and others, quality levels are not what the globals are. And so as we cycle through second time buying, and the word goes out. Word of mouth, yeah. Word of Very mouth. Powerful. People are moving back toward globals and away from Chinese domestics. Um, but the, don't, I haven't given up on the Chinese domestics yet. They're fighters they'll be back and leading, leading names in the Chinese uh, brands are Great Wall, which makes some terrific SUVs, and Geely, which acquired Volvo already and is continually making better quality products. Those would be the two top. One, a third one would be Shanghai's own Rowe brand. Now, you mentioned earlier about 80 something mm -hmm. brands mm -hmm. uh, currently in China, but actually I've read before that in some cases, if you look at the origi origins of the American automaker history, right. you would see actually when you know, Ford was just starting out, there were at the same time dozens, uh, if not more than a hundred also very small uh, domestic uh, brands. And eventually the market sort of sorted itself out over the course of a couple of decades and you had a few, the three big players. Do you see that happening in China, where currently you've got 80 brands, including the foreign ones now, which is something that the U.S. did not really have to deal uh, as much with, um, but that eventually the dust will settle and you'll see a few huge players here, including Chinese automakers? Yes, it's inevitable. It's like we've seen this movie before. It's exactly what happened in the States in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, the difference in China so far is that the market demand has been so sensational that if you're in the game, you're making money. So there's been no pressure on brands or companies yet 
just last year for the first time, for example, FAW lost money. Uh, look for more of that in the next three or four years, and the weaker brands and the weaker companies will be sorted out from, from, the, from the rest. Now, you were at the Shanghai Auto Show in April. What were some of the surprises and highlights? Uh, biggest surprise, two, came to, came to mind. One is Chinese are in love with SUVs. Uh, I say surprise because it wasn't that long ago that for city folks in China, owning an SUV was not cool. It was associated, oh, that's something rural as uh, farmers use or construction. Not, we need a three box sedan, a proper car. That's changed totally. Uh, fastest growing segment is SU our SUVs and crossovers. Uh, men and women both love them. They offer uh, not only a nice image, you're riding high, arriving in style, but a lot of practical benefits. Big inside uh, space plus uh, small engines. So they're fuel efficient, spacious, and they offer a great image. So are there brands that are really standing out in terms of the models that they've built for these crossovers? Well, among, among the Chinese brands we're talking about a moment ago, Great Wall is far and away the leader, and they got real nice momentum. And then if we switch to global joint venture companies, everybody's got SUVs today. They can't build them fast enough. So none of them really sent, but all the way up and down the chain from $10,000 SUVs to, you, know, you see the Porsche Cayennes all over the road here. And the Panameras, the which Panamera, I know are yeah. not officially SUVs, mm -hmm. but they're, they're part of that sort of middle ground yes. luxury, and they've got that crossover um, look. A look and yeah. effect, but still maintaining the brand prestige. That's right. That's right. That, so I said two, two surprises. The other one was two years ago at the Shanghai Auto Show, electrics were front and center on everyone's stage because the government had announced we're going to be the leader in electric vehicles. Um, this time, not the case at all. In fact, electrics were taking a clear back seat to SUVs and regular gasoline-powered engines. Uh, the government has said electrics, at least for now, uh, has come to the conclusion they're expensive to build the range is limited, and the infrastructure isn't there. So last year, Chinese bought 12,000 electric cars out of 18 million vehicles that were sold here. A drop in the ocean. And those 12,000 were very likely not to consumers. I don't know a single private buyer of an electric vehicle. They're, they're going to taxi fleets and, and government uh, officials. And the, the hype really around electric seems to have died down, not just in China, but around mm -hmm. the world. That's right. As people take a step back and say, well, hmm, it's a great idea, but how do we actually build scale? Um, and, and how do we roll this out? Because without scale, they become very niche and troublesome uh, products to maintain and, and to really drive forward that momentum to get the market excited about it. Do you feel that the U.S. Um, and North America in general will gain traction in that area and build that infrastructure out, and then China will look at that and say, okay, you know, that's how it's, it's done, and, and now we can start to apply it here. Will they wait and look, or do you think that they are actively trying to build their own uh, infrastructure and actually push it forward? China so far remains more consistent than the United States in terms of its commitment to electrics. What China says today is, we're not giving up on electrics, but we realize it's early. So instead of ambitious targets for 2015, let's push it out to 2020. 20. Yeah. And, and I think that's great for the country in general, especially when you have surrounding topics and issues about the quality of air and, and, and sustainability and things like that. And I found it fascinating that you talk about SUVs and crossovers right. really becoming more in demand because even with the relatively smaller engines, with fuel prices at their highest point uh, in recent history here, it seems counterintuitive. Um, so at some point, we've seen this, as you said, movie play out before in the States, we had that huge um, fad of gigantic uh, SUVs. You had Suburbans. Everyone had an Escalade, you know, <laughs> Commerce. And, and didn't need them. You know, one single drivers <laughs> on the Escalades, and you know, we've seen how that worked out. Yeah. And you know, here you multiply that by five, mm -hmm. um, and and we don't want to see that movie play out. So I think it's good that you uh, talk about the commitment for the long term to build out a really sustainable alternative solution. Uh, for what will be the world's largest uh, auto market. Right. It, the, the Chinese government also respects the Chinese consumer and says, we, we, we have to deliver the kinds of products that they like to drive. Uh, and at the time being, for the time being at least, it's SUVs. 
when the electrics are ready, I think the government will beco become more aggressive and say, hey, we'll make it really attractive for you to buy electrics through incentives and other schemes. Michael, thanks for being on Thoughtful China. Be terrific to be here. Thank you. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. We'll see you again.